Hello and welcome to the Sunshine Cathedral. The Sunshine Cathedral is a different kind of church where the past is past and the future has infinite possibilities. And with that, we invite you to come and worship with us here on Sunday mornings at 9 and 1030 a.m. at 1480 Southwest 9th Avenue. Now, I invite you to come in and worship with us here at the Sunshine Cathedral. Our first reading is from the wisdom of Dame Agatha Christie. I like living. I have sometimes been wildly, despairingly, acutely miserable, racked with sorrow, but through it all, I still know quite certainly that just to be alive is a grand thing. In these human words, God's voice is heard. Our second reading is from the wisdom of the Psalter. You have made known to me the path of life, O God. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your generous hand. In these human words, God's voice is heard. God is with you. And also with you. A reading from the Gospel according to John. Glory to you in dwelling Christ. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the religious authorities, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Eternal has sent me, so I send you. When he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the one God has chosen, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. This is the gospel, the good news. Well, we need reminding, I think, that peace and hope and second and third and 40th chances are needed. We sometimes, we, we, we so want to compartmentalize, we so want to boil everything down to this linear sort of thing. And so we imagine um, this Good Friday event is, is happening all in, a, in an instant and then there's this long sad weekend and then it's just all over. You know, then you know, there's good news and everybody lives happily ever after. And that's sort of how we present it sometimes. And we forget that Jesus is executed about the year 29. And the Apostle Paul doesn't start writing anything for 20 more years. Paul, who, by the way, never even met Jesus. He claims to have had a mystical experience uh, of the resurrected Christ uh, way later, but he never met Jesus. And he, so he's writing about things that he has somehow experienced or heard over the years. So Jesus dies in 29, Paul starts writing about 50, and then Paul is executed in 64. And then in the year 70, Jerusalem and its temple, of course, are destroyed. And so, so Paul starts writing about 20 years after uh, Jesus uh, is executed, and then the first gospel is written about 20 years after that, about 40 years after the execution. So there are decades of experiences. There are decades of stories that have been building before people start writing them down. And then by the time Mark writes something, and then, and then uh, Matthew, and then John, and then Luke, and I realize that's not the order that they appear in, but I believe that's the order they were written in, that, that as they write, then they, they've either heard things differently, or they have added more of their own imaginings to the story based on their own experiences, or based on what their communities needed. And so there are just these stories that continue to build and grow and evolve because apparently, resurrection is something that isn't just needed once. Apparently, resurrection isn't a one-shot deal. Apparently, resurrection isn't something that happened after a long, sad weekend a long time ago, and that's the end of the story. And so we always find ourselves locked up in tombs and closets, falling down, feeling beaten down, being uh, frozen and lifeless with fear, and needing to be reminded to have peace and courage, and to have hope resurrected within us so that it can lift us up so that we can continue 
to move forward. We all have our stories of having faced our own sort of Golgotha experiences and how that didn't end up being the end of the story, how somehow we were able to affirm that there were possibilities beyond that problem, beyond that heartache, and eventually were able to experience the miraculous possibilities. I was a skinny kid. I clearly found the cure for that. And so not only was I this skinny kid, this, this little kid in, in, in the uh, hills of some place, I forget what it's called, the, the name, it escapes me, but uh, in the, in the, uh, growing up in the mountains, I'm this, I'm this little skinny kid. And so all of the people around me, neighbors, friends, relatives, they're, they're hunting and they're fishing and I've got no time for any of that. Um, I mean, I, I, I enjoy, you know, you know, Charlie's Angels pose every once in a while, but I wouldn't ever really hold a gun. I mean, that, was, that wasn't me. So, P.S., I didn't really fit in, is what I'm saying. You might, uh, you might not have understood. I, I didn't fit in. And on top of that, I was kind of a sickly kid. I was, um, I had all kinds of things. I always had tonsillitis and pneumonia and, and uh, all, I had scarlatina. I mean, I, had all, I was just a sickly uh, kid, uh, asthma. I was a mess. I would later realize, though, that living in toxic environments has a deleterious impact on one's emotional and physical well-being. It's amazing that the minute my toe crossed a state line, my health improved dramatically. Um, miracles, right? And then I came out my, my freshman year in college. It, uh, I, I really didn't have enough support in high school to figure it all out or, to, or even to try anything out, really. Uh, so, I, uh, so, so in college, though, wow, there, there's a world, yay. And uh, so, so I was able to try some things and meet some people. And, and, uh, and, and you know, I, if I'm going to do it you know, in for a penny, in for a pound, I mean, I'm going to do it all the way. So I was, I was as out as I had been in. I was like, whoa. And uh, so I was the one that would get asked to speak to sociology classes and psychology classes about the reality of, of my clearly odd sort of life, this, you know, where you can be attracted to someone of the same gender or love someone of the same gender. And so that was a lot of fun um, in the 80s. And then as, right, I'm, I'm not talking about last week, I mean, this was a long time ago and not in a very progressive part of the planet still. So. Then, uh, and so, th so now I'm out, and so now as an out person, I want to answer this tug, this call, this, 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 this need to embrace and be embraced by ministry, to tell stories and to help people live out the truth of their own lives. So I want to do ministry, and yet I've already made a big deal about who I am, so there's no point in trying to take that back, and so I have to be honest about it. Well, finding a place for that to work out in the 80s, uh, was, still, was still a bit of a challenge, a bumpy ride. And then while I'm in the midst of that process, I found MCC and I'm, and I'm, work, and I'm, and I'm a, a young uh, ministerial student and, and then young minister, and in the midst of all that, this is now the early 90s, and it's still in the midst of the worst of the AIDS crisis. And so here I am barely even starting my adult life and the world around me seems to be all about sickness and decline and death. It was a terrorizing and terrifying time. It was a time of, of sheer horror. And I firmly believe that how we got through it is that we just insanely affirmed the possibility of life. We went to three funerals on a Saturday sometimes. We'd go to four or five in a week. And we would still say, every week involved a hospital visit. And we would still affirm the goodness of life and the possibilities of the future. And then once I became a minister, it's like, okay, I've worked it all out. I'm out, I'm clearly out. I'm now out for a living. I get paid to be out and help other people be themselves, right? It's all good now. Well, no, then I'm introduced to the reality of horizontal violence, of oppression sickness, of people who, I wasn't the only one who had these difficult experiences of growing up different, growing up odd, being, being sort of targeted in lots of ways, growing up in dysfunctional environments, uh, coming out, being rejected by the church. I wasn't the only one. In fact, I was joining a community where that was everybody's story. And not everyone had had as much therapy as I had. Not everybody had worked as hard as I had at it. So we're all getting together 
and working out a lot of our issues together, and some of us haven't really even started yet. And what I discovered early on is that hurting people hurt people. And so here we are, people feeling broken and wounded and excluded, and how some of us, because we just didn't know any better, how some of us felt a little bit empowered was to try to dominate, or shame, or humiliate, or exclude, or, or victimize, or beat down, or control those in our own community. And so uh, I found myself being targeted then in other ways by people not so much different from me, but by people like me. Not a unique story. Every MCC minister and most MCC leaders, maybe just most people, have that experience. So in any case, we've all learned that life isn't always easy. It's certainly not always fun. And yet, what else is there? While we are talking about the difficulties, here comes somebody just starting out minutes ago. Ah, isn't that fabulous? Isn't that beautiful sound? That babies don't know that anything is other than what it is. Babies just expect to be loved, expect that, that when I make that noise, something wonderful is going to happen. I'm gonna, I was wet, now I'm going to be dry. I was hungry, now I'm going to be fed. Nobody was paying attention to me, now they will. I was way too low, I'm going to be picked up that when I just call out, something magical is supposed to happen. And that's a wonderful way to look at life and live life. And we spend our entire adult lives trying to get that back. Life isn't always easy. And it isn't always fun. But it is powerful to be honest about that and to still say with conviction, I like life. Dame Agatha Christie, I like life. She admits, I've known misery, and still it's just a great thing to be alive. And I like life. In this season of life, of renewal, of hope, of second chances, of joyful surprises, Christie's affirmation, I like life, seems appropriate and powerful and very Easter worthy. Acknowledgement of pain or disappointment and difficulty and grief and fear does not preclude realizing that beyond or mixed with the problems, there is also resilience. There is strength and comfort and moments of relief and there are even times of exuberant happiness. I mentioned at the first service, how many times have you walked into a hospital room and somebody can't even get out of bed. They, 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 have to have, they, they have to have little plastic help to even use the bathroom. I mean, they're not in their best shape. They're eating food that they would really rather not be eating if they're able to eat at all. And yet you go in there and there's flowers and there's teddy bears, maybe there's balloons. There is celebration of hope. And, and people saying, I'm glad you're here. Even if you're in this room right now, we're waiting for you to get out and we're glad you're here in any case. That life is what there is. And as we celebrate it, as we find what's good in it, even when there are difficult things happening, we are, we are raised to new possibilities. As we affirm, I like life, it becomes true. No matter how painful, difficult, or uncertain, we can still have peace and hope and joy. We can like life, and we can know that life likes us. What would life be without us? What would life be without being lived? Life needs us just like we need it. It is a symbiotic and mutual relationship. We can like life and know that it likes us, so much so that it will never end. It will never let us go. Our bodies have a shelf life, but our divine life does not. Isn't that good news? Isn't that the message of resurrection? Are you willing to declare today that you like life? That was pitiful, you need to sing it. Yes, 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 much better, much better. Now say it like you mean it. I like life. I like life. Okay, I believe you. Duncan Howlett said, life is worth living. It is good and it is beautiful in spite of the tragedy with which it is forever beset. We glory in life undergirded by the faith that its goodness is pervasive. There is no proof for it, he says. No objective test to support the claim that life is good except the living of life itself. But this is perhaps the best test of all. And so we go on living the life we are given to live knowing that it is a good life, however difficult it may at times seem to be. And so we shall find 
that life is good to those who live it with serenity and fortitude. Because we love life. We want life to be as abundant as possible. And we honor life by choosing to believe it is worthwhile, even when it seems to be burdened with uncertainty and challenges. And when we believe it should be good and can get better, we leave the door open for improvement to enter. When we say, in spite of this thing that was painful, life itself is good, and this event doesn't define me. It's not who I am. I deserve better if I never experienced better. I deserve better. I am part of the goodness of life. And when we can say that and keep saying that, it leaves the door open for miracles to enter in. Sometimes they're gradual, they creep in. Sometimes they come bursting in. Sometimes they're small and sometimes they're big. But if we can just say, I like life, life can be more present in, through, for, and to us. And in any case, hope is more sustaining than despair. And so it's an act of profound faith to say, I like life. And just to be alive is a grand thing. Such statements are affirmative prayers proclaiming the innate goodness of our lives and the infinite possibilities that are available to us. Agatha Christie's quote, I like life, and just to be alive is a grand thing. These, these uh, statements remind me of something that Helen Keller said. First of all, notice the miracle of hearing the words, Helen Keller said. The woman couldn't hear, the woman couldn't see, and yet the woman learned how to speak, and speak so eloquently she wrote and spoke for a living. That didn't make her life easy, but it did mean that the difficulties were not the end of her story. And so Helen Keller said, all the world is full of suffering. It is also full of the overcoming of it. The world is full of suffering, but it's also full of overcoming it. And she also said, never bend your head. Always hold it high. Every time I read that, I'm reminded of that story in Luke chapter 13 of the woman who was bent over. She's been bent over for years. And Jesus somehow encourages her to the point where she can lift her head, where she can stand up, where she can broaden her view, broaden her gaze, see more possibilities than she'd seen before, feel better about her life than she'd felt before. That encountering the encouraging words of Jesus, she is able to lift her head. And Helen Keller says, never bend your head, always hold it high. She seems to be reminding us that joy isn't dependent on conditions and that life isn't always easy, but not easy doesn't mean not good. In spite of difficulties, there is joy to be had. In John 16, we read the author imagining Jesus saying, in the world there is tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. Not I have gotten rid of all tribulation. In the world there is tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. I overcome the world of discord and despair and dismay as I recall the divine I am of my being is always in perfect harmony, is always whole, is never limited by conditions, circumstances, or painful or confusing events. These message of resilience, of bouncing back, of getting up when we've been knocked down, rising with phoenix-like power from the ashes of disappointment, or we could say these resurrection messages, these messages of resurrection living are echoed in the 20th chapter of John's Gospel that we heard, read this morning. In the story, the executed but somehow alive Jesus encourages the disciples to not be lifeless themselves with fear. Remember, John is writing about the year 96. Jesus has been gone since 29. Paul has been gone since 64. The temple has been gone since 70. And here, in almost the second century, John is writing. And so he's using these resurrection messages to keep his community raised up and lifted up. Don't be lifeless with fear. We're resurrection people. Yes, difficulty happens. The world is full of difficulty, and we are full of the power of rising above them and moving on. And so, here is Jesus encouraging the disciples in John's story to not be lifeless with fear, but to feel as if divine life was flowing through them and expressing as them. And he breathed on them the breath of life, a symbol for life. And he breathes on them, and he says, receive the holy breath, the holy pneuma which means breath or wind or energy or power or life force or spirit. 
Receive the breath of life, the breath of wholeness, the Holy Spirit. Receive the holy breath, the power of life, that sense of indestructible wholeness, and then get back to living and helping others do so as well. And that's what living in his name, that you might, that you might believe in and, and have life in his name. That's what believing, that's what life in his name means. It means to remember these stories and make them your own so that the life of encouragement, the breath of hope is always filling you so that you can continue to move forward. These people are locked away in a locked room. They're hiding. They're afraid. And John seems to be telling his fearful community, I don't know what's going to happen on the other side of the door. Something bad might happen, but nothing good is happening while we're in hiding. So let's at least take the risk. And if something bad happens, let's let it be because we were doing something worthwhile. Better to fall with dignity than to hide in fear. And so he encourages them to be filled with the breath of life and to move forward. That's life. In Jesus' name. By remembering Jesus' courage, we can experience peace beyond pain and hope beyond horror. And that's what we are being encouraged to do today. That's what is meant when Jesus says to them in the story, peace be with you. Receive, receive the Holy Spirit. That's a more affirmative way of praying what the psalmist prayed in Psalm 51. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me, implying that the psalmist knew that that spirit was already part of him. That was already the truth of his being. And so he's saying, basically, let me always remember this truth. Luke, in the book of Acts, shares the same message. But instead of Jesus breathing on them like in John's story, Luke has the room where they are being filled with wind and flames. Wind bags and flames. I've been to those parties. Wind and flames just all throughout the room. A strong wind blowing through the house and flames bursting out over every person. A different image for being filled with the indestructible life that we call God, but it's the same empowering concept. The psalmist says, I know that your spirit is in me. Please let me always be aware of that. John imagines Jesus breathing the breath of life on them to remind them that it is part of them. And Luke imagines the wind filling the entire house, empowering and energizing a movement. The Apostle Paul says the exact same thing when he writes to the church in Rome, but he says it without all the dramatic flair. Despite the fact that I think Paul was probably gay, he was deadly dull, really. But... <laughs> He, he just writes very simply, the spirit of God dwells in you. The spirit of life dwells in you. And guess what? That energy, that divine power, that divine life, that is eternal. That means without beginning and without end. There is no shelf life. So when your body just can't go on, that you that is you will. And so that gives us strength and encouragement in this life as well as assurance that life is more than this experience. The life of God is in you. As we pray every Sunday now at the beginning of the service, we are the breath of the ancestors. We are the spirit of God, the life of God embodied. We are the incarnations of divine possibilities. We are that spirit of life in form living life. We are divine life learning to remember our sacred value, our divine potential. We are life learning to love itself through human experiences. We are the indomitable spirit learning to trust our goodness even when difficulty threatens to distract us from that holy awareness. And so as we remember and as we live in the power of the remembering, that is living in Jesus' name. That is receiving the holy breath. And this is the good news. Amen. Do you need a little more resurrection? And maybe when you need it, wasn't just when it was being talked about. Last Sunday, the choir was singing Handel's Hallelujah Chorus, and Kiwan sang happy, and we, dan we got happy and, sang and danced in the aisles. And but maybe you came in feeling good already. Maybe you just went from Good to better that day. Maybe today is the day that you need to be lifted up. Well, that's the good news about these stories is that they continuously are told. Whatever happened in 29 wasn't the end of the story. And so Paul imagines things and, and talks about his experiences in his way. And then 
here comes Mark, and here comes Matthew, and here comes John, and here comes Luke, and here comes us. Did you need to be lifted up? Did you need to be reminded that there is something within you, some part of you that is indestructible, indomitable, always good and everlasting? Are you ready for that resurrection experience? Do you need it today? Well, the good news is it's available to you today. Jesus, according to the tradition, gathered with friends to share a meal in the midst of difficulty. As if to demonstrate that optimism is always available no matter what is going on, no matter what is happening, no matter how bleak things look. And so gathered with people, he demonstrates that when we gather together, when we share what we have, when we eat a meal, no matter what we are doing, we can experience the presence of God because there's not a spot where God is not. And so Jesus, after that meal, took a piece of leftover bread and blessed it by giving thanks because gratitude is the best way to bless anyone or anything. And then he broke the bread as if to say, when you were feeling broken, remember there is divine wholeness beyond that experience. He said, take and eat and remember. And then he took Elijah's cup and he blessed it and he offered it to everyone, leaving no one out, saying, drink all of this all of you. This is a cup of a new and everlasting covenant, a covenant that includes all people. And whenever you drink this, remember. Holy One, we give thanks that at this table you are reminding us of our oneness with you and with one another. And so we give thanks for this and we allow these simple elements, these simple symbols to remind us of the profound truth that wherever we are, you are and all is well. Amen. Sunshine Cathedral, we practice an open communion. And what that means is you don't have to be a member of this church or any church to receive the sacrament, just as you are. With whatever your beliefs or doubts may be, you are welcome to participate in this feast of unconditional love. My friends, these are the gifts of God for all the people of God. Hello, I want to thank you for joining us for worship today here at the Sunshine Cathedral. Again, if you're ever in the Fort Lauderdale area, please stop by and worship with us on Sundays at 9 and 10.30 a.m. If you'd like to find out more about the Sunshine Cathedral, about our resources, or about our books published by our senior pastor, the Reverend Dr. Darrell Watkins, or if you'd like to make a donation to the Sunshine Cathedral, please visit us at www.sunshinecathedral.org. Until the next time, may God continue to richly bless you on your journey.